Come on, they say, well, let me give a round of applause. Let me give a round of applause, please. Let me give a round of applause. Give some energy here. All right, you guys. There's one of me, 75 of you guys. I'm gonna need more noise than that. I can't make more noise than 75 of y'all. Crypto Monday San Juan, let me get some noise, let me get some energy, please. Give a round of applause, Crypto Monday San Juan. <laughs> Two things with that, man. That's like the bell sound. We ready to roll, man. We rocking, we rolling, we live. I got my man here running like he one of the original cypherpunks. All parties I do will all come from him. Make sure you know that they're the cypherpunk parties. <laughs> <laughs> they all his parties. Yeah, especially when the police start coming to your parties. Uh, police come <laughs> if the police show up at the door, we're sending the white guy to answer the door every time. No fail fails. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, all right, you guys. This here is a very special guest. I say it every week, but I mean it almost every week, too. Um, and this brother right here is really, 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 really special. How many people here know who Satoshi Nakamoto is? If you know who Satoshi is or heard of him, know the name, know something about him, you guys raise your hand. You know something about Satoshi? Raise your hand. Okay, perfect. This brother really knows something about Satoshi. So, these group the cypherpunks, right? Well, anyway, let me just tell you guys, this is Mr. Ryan Lanky. He's the ex-chief security officer for the Tezos Foundation. Those of you who don't know, Tezos Foundation had a $600 million token sale. Uh, it was two thirty eight, and then Bitcoin went crazy, so it got up to around $2 billion. Two billion dollars. He was the chief security officer for a blockchain that had two billion dollars under assets. So he knows a little bit thing about op security. So if you guys have op security questions, Ryan's probably a good guy to ask. But ultimately, it goes further back than that. This brother's got a long history in the Bitcoin industry, a long history dealing with Mr. Satoshi Nakamoto. So why don't you tell him a little bit more about initially the cypherpunks and what actually they are for those who don't know? Sure. So back in the early 1990s, there was a, a mailing list called the Cypherpunks. There were a couple people who were looking at all the cool computer security things that were, were happening in the, the 80s and 90s. There was uh, public key cryptography, commercialization of all this stuff. But at the same time, there was a lot of government regulation. Back then, cryptography was treated as ammunition, the same as, as weapons by the government for export reasons. And there were a lot of new regulations that were being uh, discussed about uh, restricting what people could do with their computers and what networks could do and everything else. And these three guys, Eric Hughes, John Gilmore, and Tim May got together, um, started having some in-person meetings in California, and then created a mailing list where people were discussing not just what they could do right then, but what would be possible 20, 30 years in the future with this technology as it, as it got better. And the, uh, the really interesting thing is I have archives of this list all from the 90s, and you can go to this list and just look at them, and there's a bunch of stuff that is just now being possible to build or has already happened or isn't possible technically yet, but is going to be possible in a few years. So pretty good at seeing the future. So Ryan Lackey's from the future. He was on the internet when the internet used to make a lot of noise and shit. How many of you remember when the internet used to make a lot of noise? Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. What was that shit? Yeah, modems way back in the day. Even before that, there was... Take this off here, brother. Uh, there you go. Cool, better. Uh, so back in the... Um, long time ago, people used their analog phone lines to dial in, but even before that, you had to basically be a university student, work for a research uh, institution, work for a government entity or the military to have internet access. I was, you was so, military. Uh, I, yeah, I was Obviously. so lucky back... No, no, I was lucky when I was like 12 years old, I got to take a college class at a local university, and a CS class. And I milked that for access to the internet back in like 1992 for the next several years. Did and it make noise then? It did not make noise, but you had to sit in a lab full of terminals, like uh, 1970s, 1980s styles terminals. And that's why people would, would sit on campus until the middle of the night working on this stuff. Excellent. So let's fast forward a little bit. Let's talk about these cypherpunks and their relation to our guy, Mr. Toshi Nakamoto. Are you Satoshi? Uh, I'm definitely not Satoshi, but I... I do know, so the, the interesting thing about Satoshi is there's all these uh, ideas that went into building Bitcoin that, had, that were not completely new, they were not novel, they didn't come from just complete thin air. They were things that people had been discussing since uh, a patent back in like 1982, the technology developed in the 1990s, all sorts of stuff. So there was a clear pattern of people working on this stuff for a long period of time. So you know people that definitely had input that, that Satoshi read. Uh, it's, I don't think anyone knows, well I don't know anyone who knows directly who 
uh, or rather, I don't know that I know anyone who knows who Satoshi is directly, but uh, I know a lot That's of people. That's a very who, practiced answer, Mr. Yeah, yeah, Lackey. That yeah. sounds like you tell yeah. the feds. You seem like you want to make sure you got that shit right. Well, yeah. Uh, Say it again. Uh, I, I do not know that I know anyone who knows who Satoshi is. That's a very deposition <laughs> style answer, sir. Yes, yes. <laughs> But, but I do know a lot of the, the tech people that Very clearly nice. had input. Okay. And it's, it's, it's obvious who they are. There's like Hal Finney, there's Adam Back, there's Tim May, there's David Chom. There's, there's like 50 people that had Shout a lot of David input. Chom. We'll get David Chom down here in San Juan at some point. I know awesome. David Chom's one of the homies as well. Um, yeah, so these cypherpunks, man. You guys are just like internet nerds in the 90s long before. You guys are like Revenge of the Nerds in the 80s, but in the 90s, plotting on the world and thinking about what we're going to build. Yeah, there was, there was a lot of, uh, I mean, as you can sort of imagine from looking at like Bitcoin talk early days and a lot of other crypto people, they're not the easiest to get along with and they don't have the most mainstream beliefs. So there was a... Uh, I've whole, met so far five of them. You're the only one that wants to hang out and talk. There's, there's a fair number in other places. So. I'm just telling you, brother, what I've done. Oh. I don't know about anybody else. Okay, I've met five cypherpunks so far. I know five of them. There's one of them lives in the community here. He doesn't want to ever come out to our meetings. Okay, I, I will invite some of the people that I know. From Bam. The More cypherpunks, please. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Maybe for December, like the uh, crypto. Uh, but yeah, there's so there, there's a lot of uh, controversy and strife. Shout out to Puerto Rico Blockchain Week. Puerto uh, Rico Blockchain yeah. Association, the house. Give a round of applause to Ms. Keiko. Round of applause. Yeah. Puerto Rico Blockchain Week is when? December 5th through the 13th? Through December 6th through the 13th. If you have a project that's worth being a part of Puerto Rican Blockchain Week, you let us know. December 6th through the 13th, we're putting together a stream of conferences, events, and all types of things associated with blockchain in San Juan. Puerto Rico Blockchain Week, San Juan, December 6th through the 12th. Y'all come see us. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Cool. But yeah, so there was all sorts of people that had beliefs that ranged from basically hardcore communist to crazy right wing to libertarian to everything else all on the same mailing list all discussing technology and how they could use their technology to either make the state the strongest thing it had ever been or to overthrow the government and make it impossible to govern anything to just make it easier to send secure email back to people there's people who thought that um, modern technology was causing people to lose a lot of the rights they earlier had like back in when the country was founded, you could just send a letter to someone and be reasonably confident that there wouldn't be somebody scanning the cover of every single piece of mail that was sent. So all you needed to do was have legal protection against opening the mail. Right now, the Postal Service actually scans the cover of every single piece of mail that's sent in the United States uh, for addressing purposes. But uh, they, they certainly don't delete it. And so they can build up a network of who's mailing whom and, and why. Um, and that kind of stuff just didn't exist. So there's the idea on the cyberpunks list that technology could take us back to an earlier uh, level of privacy that previously existed de facto by using technology to protect it. And there's other people who wanted to use it to like take over the world and do all sorts of crazy stuff. <laughs> These guys go together. We got the guys that are privacy advocates, and we got the guys who want to take over the world. Yeah. These guys all hang out together, smoke weed and mushrooms, and you know, plot shit. But um, ultimately, which one did you fall on? Did you want a privacy? Or did you want to take over the world? Uh, I mean, I was like. 13 to 16 years old when Take I was world, that list. So it was, it was definitely build your own country offshore, take, take over, over the world, world, everything else. And then a couple years later, mm -hmm. uh, so I lived in Anguilla, this little Caribbean. So uh, back when crypto was regulated, it was also patented in the United States, the RSA algorithm. So we couldn't do a lot of development in the United States. So I lived in this little Caribbean island near St. Martin called Anguilla, where a Dutch citizen was sitting next to me. I would write something, I would publish it to the internet, and he would then download it and implement it. And that way we could export something from the United States because we have very strong First Amendment protection. So as long as you publish the source code to something, that's just free speech. That but seems you, like a very practiced deposition yeah. statement as well. Oh, it, was a, rock with it, it was exactly how, it was how, how PGP, don't worry. Yeah, it was how PGP and a bunch of stuff got exported from the US because there were a lot of developers in the US and a lot of users outside. Otherwise you had to go through this whole like export control process and everything else. Okay, so let me stop you right there really quick because I want to highlight this because I know the feds are listening. Hi. Um, <laughs> They listen every week. I get calls from the people, the Alphabet Boys and shit like that. I invite them on stage, but sometimes they just don't. But anyway, so you guys check this out. Listen, this was happening. What year was this, brother? This was 96 to 99. This was in 96, when entrepreneurs were recognizing the laws in the U.S. were preventing them from innovation, so they were smart enough to go to other markets where they had the ability to work on the innovations they were creating. Here we are in 2021, and we still have this problem. Not only do we still have this problem, but it's getting worse. Not only is it getting worse, but other countries 
are growing by leaps and bounds because technology scales faster than anything else and any other kind of innovation that's ever existed in humanity. And other markets are capitalizing off of technological innovations because of US regulatory restrictions. And this has been happening since 96. So feds, I know you're listening. Listen to that. But go ahead, keep going. Okay. So, so I did that and then uh, at some point a couple years later there was this crazy idea to go to this World War II anti-aircraft platform that the British had built in the North Sea that they sort of left abandoned after the World War II and um, declared itself its own country during pirate radio days back in the 60s and we built a data center on it. So from 99 to 2002 we were running a, a crazy offshore data center on a place that declared itself its own country to be able to export a lot of the stuff. Which was Shout out to Independence. I dream of the Puerto Rican Independence one day. I, I, think, I think in 50 years we're going to have 500 countries if we have, if we have five. So. It's one or the other. It's going yeah, to go yeah, one or the other. Yeah. I get it, it doesn't make sense. The current agree, level is not the, the stable level. It's going to be like one dominant, like really big bully, and there's going to be either that or you know, yeah. shit ton of little liberal states. Okay. But yeah, so we did that, and uh, all sorts of interesting stuff happened. People were developing all this technology you could do. Uh, the, the thing that was missing from almost everything was electronic cash. That was the single enabling technology that was needed to make everything work. Um, Did a lot you catch? Digicash, which was David Chom's project, as Zuko from Zcash was like the youngest employee there. Where was Reddit? Reddit run around somewhere. Uh, but yeah, the, the dream of anonymous electronic cash was the one enabling technology that everyone wanted. The problem was no one knew how to do it in a decentralized way. So it was, could I operate a business for 30 years and get everyone to trust it, despite being highly illegal and, and tracked down by every government in the world? That doesn't seem like a, an Not easy thing to trust. Especially because if you start that on day one, you have almost no funds to build up all the security, institutions, reliability, everything else. So uh, honestly, a lot of stuff was, was thought about in the 90s that was going to be potentially possible. But without that one key technology, a lot of people sort of thought it wasn't ever going to happen. And there were ways to make it work, but uh, yeah, it basically stagnated from... I would say 9-11, 2001, until when a lot of the penalties for, there's a lot of stuff you could do where you're sort of operating on the margins of whether it's okay or not. Just like in Cuba today, people are buying, they're doing remittances by sending in um, voice over IP minutes from, from outside. And those are tradable and they're used for sort of a de facto uh, unlicensed remittances. But the, the government's not going to like throw you in jail and execute you for doing that. Uh, right after 9-11, the, the rules went in the U.S. from running an unlicensed money transmitter as like a civil thing or maybe like a very moderate thing to potentially you're funding terrorism and you go to very, like you disappear. So people got pretty scared after, after that. And then really nothing truly innovative happened in the unlicensed crypto space until Bitcoin white paper. So fast forward to the Bitcoin white paper. Where were you when you first heard about the Bitcoin white paper, did you like see it and was like, okay, this is real, I'm gonna jump on this, yeah. did you write it? So I would, I definitely did not write it. I was on the mailing list that, that it was first published on, working in a trailer in uh, Iraq, doing medical IT satellite contracting stuff, so. It's a very good alibi, sir. Yeah. <laughs> well, well I, I, yeah. Uh, it's so, fucking solid, I gotta give it, it to it you. It is pretty good, yeah. Um, All the rest of the shit you said would sound like bullshit. That no, was good. Okay. I mean, the problem was, I, there's a lot of stuff I didn't like about Bitcoin from when it, when it launched until probably 2011, 2012. Yeah. It has less actual privacy than a lot of the previous systems. It has less privacy than cash in certain ways. It does a lot of cool things, but it doesn't, um, yeah. It doesn't do uh, privacy very well. Every transaction's on the ledger, it's a global ledger. And so I was sort of hoping something better would come about. So I didn't particularly support it for the first couple of years, uh, which I, in retrospect is a, a clear mistake. <laughs> so you was looking for something better to come along. Are you still looking for something better to come along? Uh, I think better technology has come about. The one just you're gonna get people to throw shit at you on well, move. Well, one, just the existence of Bitcoin makes a lot of other stuff possible. Uh, proving, but once you do something once, it's really easy to execute. Innovate on top of it, right? So yeah. it's like once the breakthrough happens, now yeah. we can get you know better technology on the breakthrough. But ultimately, but, but just knowing something's possible makes it easier for people to just copy something, even if they don't use any of the same technology. Just knowing that the the, the thing works and that there's a demand for it and everything else makes everything easy. Like it took the U.S. like massive amounts of effort to build the first nuclear weapon. The Soviets had a little bit of spying help, but they didn't have a huge amount of help, and they built a new one with like 5% of the effort. 
pretty quickly. So going from zero to one and then from one to two are, are totally different things. Uh, but yeah, the, the stuff I really like about crypto, I mean, the, the decentralized ledger stuff is great, but I do think ZK Snarks and the privacy technologies are, are very interesting. Smart contracts are interesting. A lot of stuff that Bitcoin does not have that are interesting. And we've got the, the question of whether the incumbent with the monetary power, stability, everything else is going to ultimately be the winner or, or if there's going to be more than one winner or if technology innovation is going to be the thing that wins. And I have no predictions on that. So let's back up a little bit. You passed right along you communicating with the Satoshi guy. When did those communications happen? What was his email address? I mean, so he, he was on GMX, was the, the, the famous one. But he, I was on the same mailing list where he just published stuff. I did not email him personally. Uh, the people who were emailing him were, were like Hal Finney, Gavin, a bunch of people that were, were Bitcoin developers. I was just watching this at the time. Or whatever else. Out, this is right. but so they're going to do something different, but maybe something better is going to come along, or whatever else. Right. So 2012 or so, you start recognizing this is real. Yeah. Uh, 2011. Well, it was pretty clear 2011 that it was very real, and then 2012 was when I got a lot more interested. Okay. So fast forward to Tezos. How do you run about Tezo Foundation? Uh, they were working on one of the cool cool things out there with smart contracts and everything else. I helped out with security early on, and it's one of those things where if uh, you're involved in something early on, then you end up, uh, keep, like, you settle down and do more and more stuff with it. Uh, it wasn't like a, a conscious choice of, hey, this is the thing that I want to do for the next 10 years. It was sort of, uh, this is a cool thing, and us oh, do it next week and everything else. You had $2 billion under management. Uh, in, in crypto, yes. Two billion. Yeah. You never just think when just you know, move a little bit. Uh, so I was. So the, the, when you have a, a huge pool of capital like that, you definitely want to have systems in place so that no one has that temptation. Like you don't leave two million or two billion dollars on in in like untraceable digital currency under someone's personal signature for a variety of reasons. One temptation. Two, uh, kidnap and ransom risk. Like if you knew somebody could be. Uh, forced to transfer two million dollars on a whim, um, they can't go anywhere. Like they're, that's a, it's a pretty bad place to be. It's really bad if other people know you have access to that. It's like a big public thing. It's been in the news and everything else. So, so Ryan build systems to avoid that. Ryan has built his own personal anonymity, anonymity system, which is the signature look he has. Uh -huh. That it's been the same for the past twenty years. Uh -huh. So if you Google Ryan Lackey, every single picture you see, you will see him look just like that the black polo with the bald head, and nothing's changed. And this is his way to just mob on through it. You never know, the guy's got access to two pillows he's walking about. But ultimately, op security is your thing. I imagine you did that for the military, no? Uh, I actually did satellite medical stuff for the military. I was just a contractor. But uh, the crazy military stuff was I, I knew people from, I didn't have any contact with the military beforehand, and I knew people that were Iraqi expats that wanted to build the world's first, not just ISP, but Internet exchange in downtown Baghdad in late 2003 after the U.S. invaded, because they had left Iraq in like the 70s when it was actually a pretty decent place, and they thought as soon as Saddam's gone, this place is going to be awesome, and we're going to have so many people that want to move back, start businesses, it'll be safe, everything else, so that we'll need to set up an internet exchange so they can hear the traffic there. So I flew in on a civilian flight, Royal Jordanian from Jordan, and uh, lived in a house out in Baghdad and helped them out with that, and then the country turned into. Uh, complete chaos in, while I was there. So, so it, wasn't, it wasn't like I, I went over there with the military to work on stuff officially. It was, uh, we, we printed our own ID cards and all sorts of crazy stuff, drove around in old BMWs and uh, set up basically satellite internet for people. And then those people turned into the military. Can you set up satellite internet for me in my house? I could, but you really want to wait for Starlink. Starlink is going to be the most transformative. When Starlink? Uh, Elon. So, yeah, there's I said you're not welcome in Crypto Monday, San Juan. But I promise you, if you get internet in my house in the mountains, we'll, we'll change our mind. Okay. I mean, the thing that, that uh, Puerto Rico actually needs to make Starlink work, there's two things. Either they need to get this new inner satellite link constellation, which is going to come at the end of the year, or they need to get a ground station in Puerto Rico with big bandwidth that can then connect uh, back to the internet. And the reason they're not doing that in Puerto Rico right now is that not enough people have mailed them and demanded that they set one up, and it's also expensive to set up. Okay, how many people are here? We got about 100 people in here, right? Everybody, if you live in Puerto Rico, right, you should know we have internet-like issues here in different parts of the island. 
Starlink will help us. We all of us need to send. Who, where's Annie? At? Is Annie in here? Um, you're not Annie. I'm but, not. I'm Hollywood Watson. One second. One second. We'll get to your questions. Give me one second. We need to email the Puerto Rican whoever, whoever the Puerto Rican is that's responsible for this, and we need to get Starlink on board. It is a necessary feature. It also help USVI, VVI, DR, AD, everywhere. Everyone within a 300 miles. The first thing you need to do to get you know better uh, uh, production in an area is communications, man. It's the first thing they do when they want to you know attack somebody is take out their communications because it makes life harder. So the things you want to do to improve life in areas you live in is communications. Puerto Rico should have satellite internet for the entire island. Very basic, simple. Especially that you can't get internet elsewhere. Without it, and there's internet issues in a lot of these, you know, places that we live. It doesn't matter if you live in the mountains or not. Now, let's get some questions. We'll start with her first. Will you have something to add to that? Give me one second. Amazing. So this is captivating, and thank you so much, Starling. Do you think Starling and privacy are compatible? Uh, depends. Uh, yeah. It's certainly no worse than the small spying device that you carry around 24/7 in your pocket. Uh, so it's like, you, Starlink will be able to tell where you are on the ground. Like every satellite system can tell where the transmitter is uh, to very high precision. But I don't think that's any worse than what we're doing now. And they're, they're fixed stations, so it'll be able to tell where your house is. But anybody who has a Google Maps, a satellite view or whatever else is pretty good at identifying stuff like that. So it's, it's more that it'll be transformative for everybody who lives in a place that doesn't have high speed internet today. And also with all your work for military, and I, I'm very interested in satellites. So what's the craziest thing that satellites can do based on what you know? When you're watching crazy improvements in the air. Yeah, that's not the craziest. That's not what you know. I mean, the, the craziest thing was that the, one of the limiting factors to all of the, um, it's the same technology, the same satellite transponders are used for sending back like live drone video feeds as they are for TV stations. So there was a period of time where satellites over like Iraq and Afghanistan, any place where there's a, a conflict at the time, the government is bidding up the price of those things so high that like TV stations were going off the air because they wanted to reuse their right. spectrum. Any uh, cypherpunk questions? What is cypherpunk? Anybody got any questions? No questions. Mr. Brodry. So, do you guys or the cypherpunk still hang Shout out to Invest PR. You guys give a round of applause to Invest PR. These guys are working hard. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, do you guys still keep in contact in those same, maybe not the same mailing list, but is there still, I guess, similar things going on that were 20, 30 years ago between the same groups of people? Has it broadened? Has everyone gone their own way? What's that look like now? Yeah, it's it definitely a lot of the people are, are older now. There were a lot of people, I was like 13, and there were a lot of people who were in their 30s and 40s, so they're a lot older now. You mean you uh, get older 20 years later? You, you do, and uh, also there were a lot of internal debates about like where should these meetings be? Should they be clandestine meetings, or should they be held in public? You uh, guys are all weirdos. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. 70, 70s, 80% of them, yeah. 95, yeah, yeah. 97. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, there were a few non weirdos but, but yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people have gone into um, positions in computer security, government stuff, everything else. There's a lot of people like that. Then there's also a lot of people that went into cryptocurrency over the last 10 years and have gotten uh, super into that. A lot of the early Bitcoin people, a lot of the, like Adam Back. I mean, Adam Back was one of the main contributors to both the technology behind what eventually became um, Bitcoin and a lot of other cool stuff on, on Cyberpunk's mailing list. A lot of people became university professors, a pretty diverse group of people. Uh, and then uh, there are meetups. I'm going to a conference in Vegas, DEF CON, which was sort of loosely affiliated with this kind of thing for the last 29 years. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff around the world. Um, What's DEF CON? DEF CON is five to seven August in Vegas. I may go. You should. Well, you're welcome to come. We well, yap about it. Any other questions for Mr. Ron Lackey? So you'd said that, uh, yeah, please help yourself. Um, <laughs> uh, you'd said that it took you a little while before you made a move into Bitcoin. Um, what was it that actually was the catalyst for you to join the movement? Uh, it was a couple of different things. I was seeing traction on mailing lists and people that I knew from outside of cryptography that were, or outside of cryptography, computer security, and everything else, 
that were more like libertarian political people bringing in, so it looked like it had traction. Plus, just the, the level of, I mean, there's a, a theory about like startups and new things, is it doesn't matter how many people like something, as long as a small number of people really care about it and are like cult-like about it. And Bitcoin definitely had that. It's like a process that. here in Puerto Rico. Absolutely, yeah. But Bitcoin had that from, from day one, and it was very obvious that it had that in a sustaining way, really by 2010, 2011. 2011. So the community. Uh, it was definitely community first, and then the community. The technology, tech, there was a couple of great technical innovations, but there were nothing truly, except for the decentralization aspect, there was nothing that was incredibly uh, amazing about it. It was really the community was the, was the driver. We have the best community on planet Earth. Give yourselves a round of applause. I love it. Yeah. I know this is for a fact. I'm serious. I travel all over the world. I've been to probably 50 some countries and I've been to conferences in almost each and every last one of them. I promise you, the community we have here in San Juan is special. We have the time, we have the laws on our side in terms of the taxation, and we have young entrepreneurs between the ages of 30 to 50 years old that have a couple dollars that are still active, that are innovators and world leaders from a variety of places in the United States living here. Look around. Each and every last one of you is special as fuck. Every time I get to know one of y'all, I'm impressed. I promise you we're building something special right here in Puerto Rico. Give my man Mr. Ryan that can round applause.